morning students uh, it's a pleasure to meet you here although i can't see you you guys can see me and i wish i was meeting you in the campus which i know is a phenomenal place i love going there i miss going there last year i hope i'll be there this year uh and um i know you're all in different locations so let's make the best of what is a tough situation for all of us so um um i'm happy to be here and um, durgesh bhai is here thank you durgesh bhai for sitting in my class um and um, you know i've been asked to talk to you specifically about a topic which i don't really think a lot about because you know i'm now 50 i'm going to be 55 years old in, in a few months and i was asked to speak on the title of the talk which is what i wish i knew when i was 17 and i was thinking about that a lot you know what have i have learned over the years and what i could have learned from my education system that i went to i started in delhi um you know in delhi public school then i went on to um study at the kirori mal college then i did my chartered accountancy then i went to uh, do my c uh, do, do my uh, masters in 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 economics from the london school of economics so i've had a um experience of uh, studying in various places but none of those places really taught me things that i'm going to talk to you about today and it turns out that i know a little bit about flame and um, i have kept in touch with the evolution of flame university over the years and i find that there are things that flame university is teaching that i wish i was taught when i was your age so what i'm going to do today basically is i'm going to talk to you today about the practical utility of some of the ideas that you have studied in school that i believe you already studied in school and over here now the problem that i'm trying to address is this that modern education system is very good at teaching these concepts you know we are very good you know our schools and colleges and universities are very good in teaching you some really important academic concepts and they are very important but unfortunately the professors don't contextualize it because it's not easy to do that as to how these ideas will help you really understand the world out there now nobody teaches you how to use these ideas so what i'm going to do is to just to give you a small idea as to how to go about doing that and these are very important ideas that you have already learned uh, hopefully you would remember each and every one of them there are about eight of them that i'm talk, going to talk about the problem is that you learn these things and then you get busy with your life and then you forget that you learned these things and that they are very important in understanding how the world works and they can really help you in becoming wiser richer happier you name it whatever you want to do so when i look back at my own life and think about the things i wish i knew when i was 17 i would list them like this uh, i mean basically there are five things i wish i knew these five things the first one is just how powerful so these ideas are which are taught in academia and how useful they are in making decisions or understanding how the world works second how becoming a wiser person over time requires requires constant application of these ideas third that these ideas will come from multiple disciplines um and uh, you will have to learn to be a broad thinker by picking up these ideas from different disciplines and unfortunately for me when i was your age this uh, this this kind of teaching was not common it is not common even today but as it turns out um i know that uh it's it's there for you you know you're lucky to be in flame university in my view because flame university actually encourages interdisciplinary teaching and learning and as i understand shortly you will be doing a course tejas was telling me yesterday which actually teaches you just that so you will have specific specific courses which will encourage you to pick some of the best ideas from multiple disciplines combine those ideas and try to interpret the world so you're not going to look at the world from just one subject you're going to look at the world from many many subjects and that the fourth thing is that i wish i knew was that you only need a handful you know there are not very many of them and if you could get a handful of these ideas from these key disciplines they will they will really help you and then of course the point is that they they combine so there is this synthesis that you pick one idea from one discipline another one from dis another discipline this could be you know physics could be chemistry could be biology could be mathematics could be psychology 
uh, it could be you know uh, history uh, there are so many subjects to learn from and the basic idea here is that if you want to become wise then um, you have to have, be willing to what one of our gurus chali manga calls as the willingness to jump over these jurisdictional boundaries and flame encourages that uh, and i think that's uh, something that uh, uh, that i really love about flame university and i think you will love it too now what i'm going to do is actually not going to talk about this this point because this is something that you will learn when you study that course on uh, on mental models what i'm going to do is actually going to take one subject just one and of course only a few ideas from that subject there are many more ideas in that subject and the subject is mathematics so i'm going to take mathematics <coughs> as a way to illustrate the importance of some of the things that you have already learned or are learning and how they are how immensely practical they are how incredibly useful they are in in uh, in, in in daily functioning you know not just day to day decision making but also long term decision making i i'm going to talk about my profession i'm an investor um how these ideas help me routinely but i also want you to understand that these ideas are moldable you can use them in almost any field so let's talk about those ideas now so the first idea that i want to talk about and you are very familiar with this is the idea of compound interest now you know we you probably know this that compound interest is often called the eighth wonder of the world now what does this formula actually tell us the formula is there on the screen basically it tells us how money compounds over a long period of time it's a non linear outcome as you can see here that money grows exponentially anything that is following the compounding formula will grow exponentially now you all know that if you compound money over 30 years at 10% a year versus say 14% a year then those 4% a year will make a huge difference in the long run you know after 30 years you will end up with much much more money with 14% annual compounding than with 10% annual compounding and you can see that over there uh with a 10% compounding over a 30 year period 100 bucks will become 1745 bucks with the 14% over the same period that will be more than 5000 bucks i think you also know that how regularly investing at good rates of compounding will produce very large sums of money over a long period of time as opposed to irregular investing but the question that we need to answer is where do you find the money for this regular investing what kind of efforts are involved in doing this the effort that is required uh, is called delayed gratification and i'll talk about that in a minute but essentially this is what i'm talking about this is simple interest versus compound interest linear outcomes versus non linear outcomes so how do you get there how do you get to become financially rich and by the way the the model of compound interest is not just about money as i will explain while you are taught this subject in mathematics to think about compounding of money but that just an example right because you can use this power this model to think about all sorts of compounding it could be compounding of knowledge it could be compounding of bacteria viruses it could be so many things out there but essentially we are talking about what happens when growth rates are happening at a compound rate of interest versus happening at a simple rate of interest and the answer, the, the 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 outcomes are vastly vastly different right so let's just go back to how do you get to a very large sum of money over a long period of time now but one of the things that investors like me um like to do right that's our what we're trying to do here uh so the answer is uh, a term called delayed gratification now what does this mean it means a lot of things it means for example uh near term sacrifices it means uh playing the long game it means uh giving up something today to have much more of it after a few years right delaying the gratification saying no to temptation these are all very important concepts that the compound interest formula teaches us and the idea of delayed gratification was first articulated by a guy called Walter Mitchell who wrote a wonderful book he was a psychologist and he wrote a wonderful book called the marshmallow test and the marshmallow experiment actually is a very fascinating experiment um and i'll just play a video explaining how that experiment works uh 
so what what happened was that they took these school kids uh, you know seven eight year old five six seven eight year old eight year old school kids and they gave them a choice that you know you they put them in a room and they put a marshmallow the couple of you know one marshmallow on the table and they put cameras in the room and they left the room and they were given instructions that you know if you if you eat this right now you can have this but if you wait 15 minutes uh, you can have two marshmallows so obviously two marshmallows is better than one but 15 minutes is a lot of time right for a kid to wait for those two marshmallows so they wanted to see what happens to these children and most of them actually could not resist the temptation most of them wanted to have the one marshmallow marshmallow right now then to have two you know 15 minutes from now and uh, th that was one part of the experiment but the most interesting part of the experiment is as to what happened to these kids the ones who delayed gratification and the ones who didn't so there was a follow up study done you know 15 20 years later because these are now young adults and the uh, author here walter michel michel wanted to find out what happened to the lives of these people and how many of them were successful and how many of them were not successful what happened to those who delayed gratification and what happened to those who couldn't uh, so this is a explained recent uh, in, a, in an interesting talk uh, at ted sometime back so i'll just play that uh, short video for you now i'm here because i have a very important message i think we have found the most important factor for success and it was found close to here stanford psychology professor took kids that were four years old and put them in a room all by themselves and he would tell the child a four-year-old kid johnny i'm going to leave you here with a marshmallow for 15 minutes if after i come back this marshmallow is here you will get another one so you will have two to tell a four-year-old kid to wait 15 minutes for something that they like is equivalent to tell us we'll bring you coffee in two hours <laughs> exact equivalent so what happened when the professor left the room as soon as the door closed <laughs> two out of three 80 marshmallow five seconds 10 seconds 40 seconds 50 seconds two minutes four minutes eight minutes some lasted 14 and a half minutes <laughs> couldn't do it could not wait What's interesting is that one out of three will look at the marshmallow and go like this. Look at it, put it back. <laughs> they would walk around, they would play with their skirts and pants. That child already at four understood the most important principle for success, which is the ability to delay gratification, self-discipline the most important factor for success. 15 years later, 14, 15 years later, follow-up study. What did they find? They went to look for these kids who were now 18 and 19, and they found that 100% of the children that had not eaten the marshmallow were successful. They had good grades, they were doing wonderful, they, they were happy, they had their plans, uh, they had good relationships with the teachers, students, they were doing one fine. A great percentage of the kids that ate the marshmallow, they were in trouble. They did not make it to the university. They had bad grades. Some of them dropped out. A few were still there. With um, so I think it's important to recognize the, import, uh, the, the role of uh, delayed gratification in success, which is what comes out in this particular talk. But let me elaborate a little bit more. So you have this formula in front of you, A equals P times one plus R to the power of N. Now let A be the eventual outcome that you desire. You know, of course, I'm now moving away from talking about compound interest from the perspective of money and compounding of money to a more generalized idea, the wisdom in the compound interest formula being applied to other aspects of life. So let A be something that you truly desire, something that will make you very happy. That's something, a goal that you want to achieve in life sometime, right? So that's A. Let P be your starting position, which is what it is in the formula, right? This is the initial investment that you make, the principal amount. Let R be the outcome of effort that you put in over time, 
that should rise over time if you're good. If you're really good at something, you should get better over time. So R is not a constant. So R is a rate of return. If you're good at your game, you'll get better. If you're a good sports person, if you practice, you'll get better over time. If you're a good um, academic, if you practice teaching, you'll become a better teacher over time. If, you're a, if you want to be a good investor, if you practice hard and learn over the years, you should become better over time. In any discipline, uh, the re return on your time, the return on your effort should, should get better, right? So that's R. Let N be the period over which you put that effort. N is, of course, the number of years in this case. Now, what does all this mean? We have all the variables explained in a different context. What are the main lessons? One lesson is that the larger the P, the more the A will be if other things remain the same. If R doesn't change, if you keep R constant, if you keep N constant, if you put more money, you're going to end up with more money, right? Because the higher the P, the higher the A over a long period of time. Now, the question is, how do you increase this P? Especially when you talk about P as putting it over a long period of time, not just one time, through regular effort. One way in financial uh, terminology is to be frugal, right? Because what does frugality mean? It means that you're very careful with your money, for example, and uh, you are willing to delay gratification now for a better A later. So let me give you a few wonderful examples from frugality that have influenced me. This is Ben Franklin, um, one of the founding fathers of the United States, and he wrote many books. One of them is a book called Poor Richard's Almanac. And he writes this, you can read what is written over here that, you know, you should, you want to enjoy life. Sure, everybody wants to, you only, if you think that you only live once, you want to enjoy life. So you really have a choice. You can enjoy life now a little bit and have a poorer life later on, or you can make, a, make sacrifices now and have a much richer life later on. It really boils down to the trade-off between short-term enjoyment and long-term enjoyment. And you know, it's, it's important to understand that this whole idea of delaying gratification is the character trait. You know, you've got to imbibe this trait in you early on in your years. And as the experiment showed, the kids who had it, they became successful. And the kids who didn't, they were not. But it's not something that cannot be learned. It can be learned because there are teachers out there who teach you the importance of delayed gratification. There are role models out there. Uh, another lesson is that if you have a long period of compounding ahead of you, then you'll end up with a much larger A. No, notice if you keep P the same, don't change P and don't change R. If you increase N, the, the period over which you will do the compounding, you will obviously end up with a much larger sum of money, right? Love much larger number, whatever A you want it to be. What that means is that the earlier you start, the better. You know, again, don't think this is about money alone. It's about let's say building a good character, uh, creating a wonderful reputation, creating wealth, of course, achieving success, becoming healthy. All these things require time, right? So the earlier you start, the better. And Warren Buffett, the famous investor, uh, he said that life is like a snowball. All you need is a wet snow and a really long hill. Now, really long hill is, is in a sense, the N in the equation, because you know you guys are 17, 18, 19 years old, and if you live to the age of 80, 90, 100, I hope even beyond that, you have a long life ahead of you. Now, if I was addressing you at the age of 50, you would have a much smaller life ahead of you, right? So the fact that you are young today means that you are at the top of a hill. You are a small snowball, but you're at the top of a hill. And if you have a very long hill ahead of you, then over a period of time, the snowball will become a bigger snowball. It will gather speed on its own. The momentum will rise and you will achieve what you want to achieve in the long run if you, if you start early. So that's the point I wanted to make about the role of starting early. On frugality, I have a, everybody has their own stories. My story is about shampoos. You know, take a look at the shampoo. You know, one of the things about um, being an investor is they get to travel a lot. So I started traveling many years ago when I was doing chartered accountancy. I used to go around, you know, doing uh, audits of client companies um, in India. Then I went as a student. I learned the importance of living frugally because I had no money to pay for my uh, living expenses in, in an expensive place like London. 
and i started looking around and i found that you know i go to these hotels and they they have all these shampoos you know why not take these shampoos so you know i have all these shampoos with me you can see here these are photographs of the stuff i have not bought shampoo for a long time or condition actually because of covid i have cut off all my hair so i don't want to go to the barber a lot so i don't need shampoo or conditioner any right now but when i do have hair i don't do that i pick up the soaps uh you know these are so this, this is my one of my boxes in my in my in my bathroom where i collect all these things why do i do this obviously if i am not spending money on these things that money is available to me to compound elsewhere right and if i do a reasonable job of compounding that money it will become a very large sum of money over a period of time these small things really matter the point is um that it becomes a part of your character becomes part of your you know daily life that you know how can i uh, conserve capital how can i deploy capital in in areas where i can get the biggest bang for the buck and and you see all these things they are free right and you can take them with you and um and they, you can collect them and you can use them for a for a long long time in fact i haven't had the need to buy these things for years um so again i think you get the point here the point here is that there are these trade offs you can have you can spend money on these things now and have much less money later on or you can save money on these things now and then you can indulge later on in life if whenever you want to do that now another very big lesson in the compound interest formula is about the trade offs between r and n i mean life will keep you know presenting you with situation that will force you to make these trade offs you can either have a higher r which means you can you know earn more money right now get more kicks right now have more fun right now but at the cost of a lower n which means you may end up compromising a or you can have a slightly lower r but a very large n so you may have a little less fun but you putting in a lot of effort and you are creating a long runway ahead of you to compound whatever you are trying to compound whether it is knowledge or reputation or character or wealth and you end up with a very large a if your objective is to maximize a then you should play the long game focus on n n is very important here now a lot of people who don't focus on n are actually similar to the kids who in that experiment who could not you know resist the temptation because it's people who don't want to resist the temptation is only because you see to, if you have to increase n you have to reduce r you must still end up with a very large a um but the problem is that people don't like reducing r because it gives you so much kick in life right now it could be anything it could be something like you know spending time on social media spending time on social media is very enticing very addictive right but it is time that is not spent on reading a book and learning something useful it's the time that you're not spent in doing some intense thinking about a topic and doing some research writing a blog post or finding a role model and finding out what you can learn from him or her the point is that you have limited time there are these opportunity costs here right so if you are giving into instant gratification you will uh, behave like that kid who could not say no to um uh, to waiting for 15 minutes if you become greedy you will have temptation to do things that may increase r in the short term and make you happy but this behavior will result in the collapse of n and then a will not rise and if n becomes zero there will be no rise in a at all i mean if you really reflect on this you will find a lot of deeper meanings take the example of criminal behavior now why do people commit crime um i'm talking about crime for money they want to get rich quick right and sometimes they do but if they do this at the expense of n because if they get caught then all their criminal behavior will end up in regret and they are in prison right what about greed if you exercise greed in personal life or professional lives then you may increase r for a while but if n goes down you will very likely end up with a much lower a than you would have been in the case that you were not a greedy person at all that you were a patient person willing to play the long game and you did not cut corners like others there are deep lessons for here on how to conduct your life you will not for example borrow money borrow a lot of money for example when you are lucky if you borrow money uh, you can become very rich but if you become unlucky even once you can go to zero you will not for example if you are running a business exercise greed by jacking up the prices of your products and exploiting your consumers because 
you may increase your profit in the short term but you will also end up um alienating your customers who will have a reason to go to somebody else to buy from and it may look very good to you on paper right now but in the long run it will hurt you so there are all sorts of things in life that feel very good in the short term but are actually quite harmful in the long run and people who get it they get it because they understand there is a trade off i mean they don't I mean, to, in the context of the example they they don't behave like the farmer who killed the goose that laid the golden eggs and i see that a lot i see that a lot in my own field that there are these entrepreneurs who got very greedy they cut corners they wanted to get rich quick they broke laws um they uh, they did things that were not ethical so long as they did not get caught they were enjoying a larger r but they did not realize then at least um that the n is going down and down and down and they effectively got into deep trouble ultimately another big lesson in the compound interest formula is the idea of pain today and gain tomorrow now what is pain today and gain tomorrow if not the trade off between r and n that i told you about just now i mean look at sports you know take a you all i think like sports and everybody has their role model it could be sachin tendulkar it could be uh, mike tyson it could be anybody right you pick up a sports person that you admire how did they become successful if you look at their careers every single successful sports person will tell you i did things that my classmates were not willing to do i got up early at 5 o'clock and go out for practice i practice every day i did this over and over again while my all my other friends were having fun i did not do a lot of fun things that they were doing so don't talk to me about my success because i know what it took for me to get there i knew the importance of the trade off between r and n i was putting in the effort and now that you are seeing me successful you are thinking that i am lucky no it's not about luck alone uh it's about sacrifices that i made early on it's about delaying gratification it's about deliberate practice it's about getting better at what i'm doing what i'm trying to do it's getting trying to get better at my game and i embraced uh the idea of repeat behavior idea idea of constant practice the idea of deliberate practice so there's this wonderful book that i like and i recommend it to all my students and it's a book on book called the little book of talent um so the author of this book danny daniel coil he went around looking for all the talent hot spots you know wherever you find the most talented people it could be some akhada in in ludhiana where you, you know you learn how to do uh, kushti for example i mean he's been to all over the place all over the world looking for these kind of places where true outstanding performance is found and he find try to find out what are the things that these guys are doing to become so successful and one of the things that comes out is the importance of embracing repetition and he writes repetition has a bad reputation we think of we tend to think of it as dull and uninspiring but this perception is titanically wrong repetition is the single most powerful lever we have to improve our skills because it uses the built in mechanism for making the wires of our brains faster and more accurate which is what education is about right you've been taught to use ideas learn ideas uh, over and over again embracing repetition means changing your mindset instead of viewing it as a choice you view it as your most powerful tool as the martial artist and actor bruce lee once said i fear not the man who has practiced 10000 kicks once but i fear the man who has practiced one kick 10000 times so one of the things that comes out when you study people who are extremely successful is that they believe in reps they keep doing the same thing over and over again so it could be you want to be a good um batsman then you're doing uh, let's say uh, a certain kind of a swing or certain kind of a square cut or uh, or a cover drive uh over and over and over again you keep doing it from morning till afternoon till evening you're not doing it for one hour you're doing it for thousand times so you in a sense you take away your watch you just don't look at the time you don't do practice in terms of um uh, i'm going to do one hour of this no that's not how it works these guys say i'm going to keep doing it till i get better i'm going to keep doing it till i get exhausted and i'm going to fall down 
and I'm going to start tomorrow morning. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to keep doing it over and over again. I'm sure you've seen many movies of martial arts when there is this Chinese martial art trainer who tells this kid to learn how to become a good uh, martial uh, artist, and he says that you have to do this one thing. and only one thing but you have to do it like 20000 times keep doing it from morning till night one move one move and you get better at it the thing about learning is it's all about compounding you know knowledge skills they compound over time if you remember the chart you know you are the chart goes like that right so you are getting a little better a little better a little better and suddenly you become an expert the day you become an expert the chart goes through the roof this is what compound interest is that if you look at the way things compound that nothing there is very small difference between a simple rate of compounding and a and 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 a, and a, and a, um, a simple rate of interest and a compound rate of interest over a short period of time it's only after a while when the breakout happens right this is exactly what is being articulated over here over our lives especially when it comes to developing skill and the skills of our kids soccer practice 2 hours piano practice half an hour we think if we just put in the right amount of time we'll get better right well, that's wrong the best way to measure progress is not in minutes or in hours but in the number of quality repetitions you make basically in the number of new connections you make in your brain instead of practicing piano for an hour make five intensive repetitions of that new song instead of hitting golf balls for half an hour make 20 quality swings with each club instead of reading that textbook for an hour make flash cards and grade yourself on your efforts ignore the clock instead focus on what truly matters get to the edge of your ability and make quality reaches and repetitions just beyond it you'll accomplish more in much less time the other thing that comes out of understanding compound interest formula is that small improvements you know the difference between a 10% compound rate and an 11% compound rate is not much right in the short term it won't show up it won't show it's only in the long run that the breakout happens so one of the big lessons that come out for me has been that what is the importance of small changes small little changes little bit change you know for example if you want to um if you want to give up sugar you know i have a friend who is very fond of sugar and i've been advising her that you can't give up sugar so easily so you know do one thing you put uh, one spoon of sugar in your tea every day take out one grain and put it away next day take out two grains after another four or five days take out three grains and over a period of time you will find that you don't need sugar in your tea anymore and so on the point is that there are immense benefits of slow compounding over a very long period of time if you get better at anything you can accomplish things that are not possible otherwise uh i'll skip this one because i think we are spending a lot of time in just one one of the topics there are many more to cover so you have to learn how to produce a uh, non linear outcomes and the the magic of compounding is obviously very useful so let me get to the second idea there are eight of them the second idea is something that you learned i think already it's called proof by contradiction now again this is something that is taught in school um you learned it in school and basically uh things like you know how do you prove that the square root of 2 is an irrational number i mean you did that right long back in school uh, or maybe a couple of years back in school you start by assuming that uh that it is a rational number and then show that if it was a rational number it will result in an absurdity right so it was very classic way of learning uh how to prove something uh uh by using um you know uh contradiction uh now what does this mean it means that what is the algorithm here it means that uh you start with as i'm assuming that the proposition is correct then you show that if the proposition was correct it will result in an absurd outcome reductio ad absurdum and if 
it results in an absurd outcome, it must mean that the proposition was false, right? So this is, I think, an extremely, extremely powerful idea that how do you disprove something? So I do this a lot in my field and I think you will apply, you will um, find it extremely useful to remember that idea that that one thing that you learn about proof by contradiction is an incredibly powerful tool to apply in, in all kinds of disciplines, including my disciplines. I'll give you one example. I'll actually give you three very quick examples. I won't go into the details. So Warren Buffett is a very successful investor and he keeps away from uh, speculative markets. So back in 2000, he figured out that the dot-com companies um, were overvalued. How did he do that? He very simply did a mental calculation that if these valuations were correct, then he figured out what these companies needed to earn to make them correct. And he showed then that it is impossible for these companies to be making this kind of money for these valuations to be correct because there aren't enough people out there to use those websites or uh, there won't be enough revenues and earnings. And therefore, the proposition that this is the correct valuation is false. Similarly, uh, a guy called Ralph Wenger, uh, again an investor, he figured out a while back, and I show this uh, in some more detail into my students in finance courses, that the disk drive industry in the United States, when the disk, drive, disk drives were created and hard drives, uh, which you use in our computers, there were about 30 companies. And he, he showed that most of them will not survive because there is only place for two or three companies. And he showed that in the aggregate, these companies are overvalued because uh, they all, all can't survive. There will, there will only be two or three survivors. So to be optimistic about the fortunes of these three com or, or these 30 companies is wrong. It's wrong because they all can't have it. They can only, only 27 of them will die. And that's what happened. Then there's a guy called Harry Markopoulos who actually exposed fraud. There was a guy called Bernie Madoff who did a $60 billion fraud a few years ago. And again, I won't go into the details, except that I will show that basically he used proof by contradiction. He showed that you say that you're making so much money and everybody believes you, but to make the money that you're saying that you are making, you need to have more than the entire trading that is happening on a certain exchange for you to make that kind of money. And that obviously is impossible, right? That's not gonna happen. I mean, the point is that these ideas, the idea of proof by contradiction was taught to you in school and you then learn it, you apply it in that particular example that how do you prove that the square root of two is an irrational number? But then you forget about it. But the problem is, the, 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 the issue here is that the idea is a very powerful one. Nobody told you that, well, you can use it in so many ways. And some of the people that I just talked to you about have become very successful precisely because they use this idea. Um, and basically proof by contradiction leads to absurd outcomes on, and on one end ends up disproving a commonly held belief. Um, as you go through life, you must use this idea routinely to challenge other people's wrong beliefs and even your own. This is how you will become wiser. The idea is simple. The correct way to destroy a th theory is to show that if the theory is correct, then it must mean this, but this is impossible. Therefore, the theory is absurd. So the theory must be false. This is how all great scientists think. This is how Sherlock Holmes thought. If you read up his books, you will find that he uses that technique a lot. He says that well, uh, if you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable must be true. He keeps disproving things that this can't be true, this can't be true, this can't be true. Therefore, there's only one logical explanation left. This must be true. So he eliminates possible suspects by one by one in a murder case, for example, by falsifying his own theories. He has multiple theories. He says in his mind that maybe the butler did it, maybe the, the, you know, the, the sister did it, or maybe uh, the brother did it and so on. And then he finds out that this possibly couldn't be the case. So his mind is a very powerful mind. It can entertain many explanations. He goes around looking for evidence and destroying some of those explanations that possibly couldn't have 
been uh, the reason why the murder happened. And then he goes about picking the one theory that makes sense because all the others don't. He's using a technique called falsification, which again is a very powerful way to think. And you've done that in your school, in your college, in your in your uh, in your papers in mathematics that you're falsifying. You're showing that this theorem is wrong. What is the role of that? What you learned in school about how do you prove that theorem is wrong? If the theorem is wrong, fine, you learned that in that context, in that example. But how do you use it in life? Well, it's incredibly important to use falsification as you will learn as you go through life. You keep this idea in your head and use the importance of what you learned in falsification uh, and how people, uh, successful people use it routinely. You will see that how incredibly useful these academic ideas are. Third idea is the reductionism or simplification. Again, you did this in school, right? There is an equation called 30x plus 10y equals 90. You divide both sides by 10 and you end up with 3x plus y equals 9. You have reduced it. You reduce the problem to a simpler problem. Complex problems can be reduced to simpler problems. This is one of the techniques, one of the key things that you learn in algebra, right? Uh, but what next? How else can you use reductionism? How can you combine it with proof by contradiction? Now, let me give you an example. You already heard what I told you about what Harry Marco Polis did. He reduced the problem of believability of Bernie Madoff's uh, you know, uh, performance numbers, his trade uh, track record to mathematical absurdity. He showed that if Bernie Madoff was telling the truth about his performance, then it will lead to a mathematical absurdity, right? Because to be able to earn the money that he claimed that he was earning, Bernie Madoff would have to be responsible for more than 100% of the trades on the exchange. And that's not going to happen. That's impossible, right? So how did he do that? He simplified the problem and reduced it to a mathematical problem. And I see that a lot. I see that a lot that smart people do this a lot. They try to reduce the problem to a discipline that is one of the fundamental disciplines. And in school, in university, you read up all these fundamental disciplines. But the important thing to remember here is that reductionism, simplifying the problem to a discipline that is more fundamental to the discipline in which you are operating is a very, very powerful idea. I'll give you a very quick example here. So many years ago, Suzalon is a company which is a company which is in the business of manufacturing windmills, right? And there was a bubble in uh, wind energy at the time and the valuation of Suzalon became very high. Uh, but how do you prove it's high? Uh, and it was not just Suzalon, it was all the other companies in the world in the same industry. It was incredibly, how do you prove it is high? Well, you use the same method that I mentioned earlier. You pick the current value, then you reduce it to a problem which is more fundamental. Basically, the discipline where I'm operating is financial markets. How do you reduce the problem that I'm encountering in financial markets to a problem in physics? So let me explain. You pick up the valuation. Then you say that, well, if I bought these businesses, then I want to earn at least a 10% return, which is a very normal return to earn given that the interest rates are seven or 8%. And then I show that if I have to earn this return, these companies will have to be making so much money. If they have to make so much money, then they have to sell so many windmills. If they have to sell so many windmills, then there have to be enough space on the planet Earth to take those windmills. And I was able to see that there isn't enough place on planet Earth to have the quantity of windmills that are required to produce the revenues that are required to produce the earnings that are required to justify the valuation the markets are putting on these, this entire industry right now. Proof by contradiction combined with reductionism. Reductionism to physics because there is limited space. We know that there is no physical space available to have those uh, uh, numbers of windmills which will produce the revenues and the earnings. Again, the point is, I'm just giving you an example from my own field. As you go into different fields, you will find that the trick is the same. The tricks of reductionism and proof by contradiction are very, very useful in the way you uh, understand how the world operates and how you think about them. Another idea is that of inversion. Again, this is something that you learn in algebra. In algebra, if you remember, you keep on shifting things from right-hand side to left-hand side, from left-hand side to right-hand side, and you keep inverting right things. These are tricks that were learned. You're simplifying the problem to be sure. 
but you're also learning that by transferring some of the components in an equation from the right hand side to left hand side and from the left hand side to the right hand side you can solve the problem easier that's inversion right it's a trick that you learn but did anybody tell you that how powerful that trick is in understanding how the world works let me give you another example of inversion let's say that you are trying to figure out what is the probability of landing heads at least once in 10 coin flips i toss a coin 10 times and i want you to tell me what is the probability of getting at least one heads now there are two ways of solving this problem the long way is to calculate the probability of exactly one head plus the probability of getting exactly two heads 3 4 find them all and add them up that's the long way there's a shorter way right and you all know that the shortest way is to take one minus the probability of no heads and if you do it that way you come to a answer which is very very quick and efficient but the trick that you used was that of inversion right instead of thinking about the probability of 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 you think about just one probability and deduct it from one and the idea was articulated by a uh, algebraist called carl jacobi and he used to say invert always invert i will explain this is one you have already done so how do you use this in life in generally in life what do you use these ideas of reductionism and inversion and proof by contradiction i give you some examples of the first two but how do you use this in life so one way to invert is to instead of thinking about how to become successful in life why not think about how to become fail how to how to fail how to fail what what are the things that people do to fail thing, fail in in the, in, thing, in in their endeavors in their fields and just do, just avoid those things right and a lot of really good books are written along those lines that instead of thinking how to make be businesses better think of how to ruin them and just avoid those things you see one of the big lessons that i've learned as a observer of the world of business is that there are many many ways of creating successful businesses there are thousands of ways of creating successful businesses but there are only a handful of ways of destroying them and if you could avoid the few reasons that cause destruction then you have removed a very big part of your uh your downfall your possible downfall and again that applies in life in general right we should make a list of everything that irritates a customer rights charlie munger and then we should eliminate those defects one by one apply the same thing you should eliminate all defects in yourself you know in your own character in your own personality one by one uh or you find not just role models but anti models right people who have certain traits that you detest they say and you and you learn from these guys they say i don't want to end up like this guy i don't want this trait from me so you know sense learning can come from role models that you want to imbibe learn from copy their best um, you know character traits it can also come from anti model that i don't want to end up like this person i don't want to end up in this situation i don't want to end up like this failure and then what are the kind of things that i must avoid to 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 not have that outcome so avoiding of dumb behavior is extremely extremely important you know you look at a lot of dumb behavior out there i mean people do really unbelievably stupid things uh without thinking too much about it and it's important you know i collect these things these are videos which i show to my class and i keep collecting them over the years and i am a collector of dumb behavior including my own dumb behavior um uh the point here here is that you want to reduce your dumb behavior over time you want to get better at anything that you do over time right and the way to do that is to avoid dumb behavior and the way to do that is to not just observe your own dumb behavior but the dumb behavior of other people and um and essentially say well i don't want to do this kind of thing that people do they're like stupid things that people do uh but it's it's not something that i am i'm going to get into and so on now the fifth idea that i want to talk to you about is called small probabilities large consequences again these are things that you've learned and i will explain to you uh how how you can use those ideas in in the real sense so you know when you are taught probability in school you're taught in uh by examples like balls and urns and you know casinos and uh, cards and dice and so on and so forth right 
but there's a big problem the problem is that you know when you uh, throw a pair of dice as even these are fair pair of dice you can calculate the exact probability of getting uh, getting a 12 right uh, and the probabilities are objective they remain the same they don't change at all right uh, so whether you are looking at a ball or an ounce or you know uh, a casino or odds or you looking at uh, all these domains um, basically the probabilities are all very objective they're not but the problem is that they, these 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 situations are not representative of the real world out there the real world out there is far more complex forget about calculating probabilities you don't even know the possible outcomes so you can't even list the possibilities let alone calculate probabilities so one problem by studying probability theory in school and college while they teach you the concepts what they don't teach you is that the real world out there is actually full of subjective probabilities not objective probabilities one second these uh, courses in probability my understanding is that they don't teach you about consequences they only tell you about how to calculate probabilities but not about consequences and i'll tell you what that means let's do that by playing a little game so i'll give you a game here um, and i want some interactivity on in the chat window uh, i will have to escape from the full screen here stop the screen just a minute okay I have the chat window open here. Uh, I give you a game. I toss a coin. If it lands heads, I'll pay you fifty lakhs. If it lands tails, you will pay me ten lakhs. Ah, uh, let's see what people say. It's a good game, right? It's a game where the odds are overwhelmingly in favor. I mean, if you play this game, you will come out ahead, right? Ah. Uh, i'm seeing a lot of nos nos let me change this let me change this number from 50 lakhs to a much smaller number let's say um 50 bucks and 10 bucks right what happens then i'm seeing a lot of answers yes 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 a lot of deaths definitely a lot of you calculated uh uh that this is a good game to play right uh now let's look at what happens next if we calculate how to play the game i mean look at the odds here the probability of getting heads is 50% the probability of getting tails is 50% if it lands heads uh, you will get 50 lakhs if it lands tails you will pay 10 lakhs so the it's a positive value right it's a 20 lakh positive value every time you play this game you are expected to become richer by 20 lakh rupees so why would you not play this game now this is a question that i ask uh my students and uh uh i ask them another problem then i give them another nuance here notice now what i'm saying the game is the same but your net worth is 10 lakhs uh now will you play notice that in a typical example in the classroom this particular information is not supplied that what is your net worth and it is the most critical element of the problem that unless you know what your net worth is you don't know whether you should play this game or not if your net worth is 100 crore rupees you should play this game every time if your net worth is 10 lakh rupees you should not play this game that's the right answer right why is that the right answer the right answer that if your net worth is only 10 lakhs that uh, you should never play this game is because it it is tantamount to a wipe out right it is a you're taking a 50% chance of a wipe out you have a 50% because that's all you have if you if you play this game and you lose 50% chance you have to pay 10 lakhs and that's all you've got you go to zero right so here we have a problem which makes sense but only if you have a lot of money not if you have a small amount of money now let me change that probabilities and ask you a question in a different form you have a 50% chance of a wipe out obviously nobody likes that the way if i if i rephrase the problem the way i just did 
instead of showing you the game i ask you a different question would you enter into a game which is a 50% chance of a total wipe out everybody will say no uh instead of the people who are saying yes i think all the answers will become no if i then change the question and said that what about a 20% chance of a wipe out i think a lot of you will say no to that too if i reduce it to 1% even then i think a lot of you will say well i don't want to end up taking a chance that can take me back to zero right so what is the big lesson that you don't you do not need to take the risk of ruin no matter how good the upside is notice here we looked at a small probability if you can reduce the probability over here is 1% chance 2% chance these are small probability this is the idea that i'm articulating here small probabilities but massive consequences so the big lesson here is that you do not take the risk of ruin and by the way when i talk about ruin it's not just financial ruin i'll come to that the big lessons to learn about these models is that it's not just about the money although we use this a lot in our own professional field about money but really it's not just about the money it's about everything right it's about anything that is important to you i mean in a strategy that entails ruin the upside can never offset the the downside right this is what nasim taleb is saying famous author and philosopher so again if i give you if i put a gun on your head and i told you that um, i you know if you i give you incredible odds that there are these thousand chambers in this gun and only one of them has a bullet in them if you pull it once uh, i'll give you 10 million dollars so you have a one in a thousand chance of an instant death um now the answer uh, paradoxically is dependent on how wealthy you are and how young you are you see if you, if i was your age and somebody gave me this these uh, these terms i would probably have said yes i'll take that chance because you know i think there's a 9999% uh, 999 out of a thousand chance of my becoming a worth 10 million dollars like is cool i don't have to work anymore but if you already have a lot of money and you are financially independent you will always say no to that right so again notice that the answers change depending on your own personal situation at that point in time but the basic idea is that you do not normally get into situations where there's a small chance of ruin which can cause you to go back to zero it turns out that there are people out there who never got that lesson very well either because they got unlucky or because they didn't understand the the role of probabilities in life that when you use a lot of borrowed money you can do very well for a while but if one downturn happens and you're not uh, unable to pay your debts and you can lose everything you can lose lose a lot you can lose everything out there a lot of these people have lost a lot every almost everything some one of them actually lost his life uh because of that so basically the problem can be rephrased again and again i ask you a different way would you jump out of a plane uh with a parachute that opens up 99% of the time you won't you want to be dead sure that the, it 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 will work 100% of the time so let's just contextualize this in areas other than money it's about anything that is important to you uh like buffett or warren buffett talks about reputation you know you can do a lot of things to enhance your reputation and you can do just one thing to destroy it in one shot and therefore the big lesson that comes out of this one simple exercise is that you simply do not put at risk that is terribly important to you and this could be your health it could be your relationships it could be your reputation anything that is important to you now let me add another nuance here remember probability theory one of the things that you learned in probability theory was that if there is a small probability of something happening in one time you do you do that thing let's say um there are uh a million balls in an urn and there are only 100 red balls inside you put your hand inside the urn and take out a ball what is the probability that it will be a red ball it's very small right so the, it's a very small chance of something happening but you did it only once if you do it a million times if you do it 2 million times if you do it a billion times if you do it 10 billion times does not the probability of your drawing a red ball at least once approach 
it becomes hundred percent right. The important point I'm making is that something that is improbable becomes inevitable if you keep doing it, and that is such an incredibly powerful idea. It applies to so many things. For example, uh, criminal behavior. You may rob a bank. You may do something completely unethical or wrong, and get away with it because the probability of getting caught was low. Sure. and the upside was there you know the money was there you made that money but the problem with crime is that people always go back and do another one another one they keep doing it over and over again and you only have to get caught once you only have to get unlucky once they forget this basic idea and in, in probability that you are taught to you that improbable things if you keep doing them will over a long period of time become inevitable think about that for a moment right Now let me go to idea number six. Ah, uh, this is uh, an idea called Patsy in the game. So I'm going to give you another example. Right? Let's see what happens. Now here is an example. I want you to give your uh, uh, responses in the chat window. Assume that a coin is fair. It has an equal probability of landing heads or tails when tossed. I toss it ninety nine times and I get heads each time. For the next toss, what is your prediction? Head. Or tails. I'm seeing a lot of answers. Fifty, 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 fifty. Unpredictable can't say can be equal chance, equal chance one by two, one by two. A lot of the answers are something that you've been taught. What have you been taught? You've been taught that. Um, past probabilities don't matter that's what you've been taught right you've been taught that in this example that i have presented to you there is no memory the coin has no memory the probability of a heads and tails is the same right that's what you've been taught so if you write this answer in the exam that the probability is 50 50 in the exam in a statistics course you will get full marks if you answer this question the way you answered it in the exam in real life you will flunk let me tell you why now let me tell you why this is what buffett calls a patsy in the game uh let me explain what is the probability of getting 100 heads in 100 tosses in a fair coin if the coin was fair what is the real chance of getting 100 heads in 100 toss that's simply 0.5 to the power of 100 This is the answer. One in one, two, six, seven, blah blah blah. You can look look at this big, very large number, very small probability, right? What does that translate to? It comes to something like this. This one in one non-trillion, two sixty-seven octillion, six fifty septillion, and so on. It's an incredibly small probability. Now my question to you is this: What is more likely between the two, this probability, or the possibility that the assumption that the coin is fair is false? What is more likely of the two? That I gave you the wrong question. I was manipulating. It's a, it's a false choice that I'm giving you. The coin is unfair. It's been ninety nine times it has landed heads. the chance that will land heads you should you should bet on that the, the why am i saying that i'm saying that because i want you to become skeptical i don't want you to believe anything without thinking i want you to know that if something is too good to be true probably is untrue you will not accept the world as it is presented to you because somebody may be trying to manipulate you you will question all assumptions i started the example by asking you telling you assume the coin is fair why why do you have to make that assumption the coin is fair it's been tossed 99 times what are the chances that it will get 99 out of you know, 99 times you toss it and all the times it turns out to be heads it's not one toss or two toss notice i said 99 times there's a big difference between 99 tosses and five tosses getting five heads in five tosses is fine getting 99 heads in 99 to tosses is not fine there's something wrong here you should become suspicious about this whole thing 
you should question everything question all assumption that is the key big lesson that comes out of here that don't be a patsy in the game don't just take these examples that you learned in school and apply them like copy cut and paste they are not cut and paste they tell you about something they tell you about the independence of events they tell you about the probability of a coin toss but they don't tell you about the world being a manipulated place the world somebody trying to manipulate you or give you some information that he wants you to believe which is not true you just automatically automatically assume that to be true so question all assumptions here's another story this is idea number 7 which is called which is training you to think like a statistician and you've all studied papers in statistics and i'll give you a story it's a very interesting story it's a real story you're looking at a plane which has a lot of bullet holes in it you know this is a plane uh, the, uh, depiction of a, of an aircraft in world war 2 uh, these are planes um, that had been hit by enemy fire and us military was examining the planes that had been damaged when they were attacked by enemy fire when they were out on missions the us military officers looked at those planes and they wanted to you know make sure that these planes uh, become stronger so they found out that the areas which took the hits were the ones which needed additional armor right they put additional they wanted to put additional armor on all those red spots where the planes had taken hits now a guy called abraham wald a statistician he looked at the problem and he came to the exact opposite conclusion and he said put additional armor on the parts that were undamaged that were not touched why did he do that think why did he do that well joseph got it right those are the planes that did not return wald noted that the military only considered the aircraft that had survived their mission these are the ones which came back right what about the ones which never came back where were they hit any bombers that have been shot down or otherwise lost had logically also been rendered unavailable for assessment so you're looking at a sample of survivors what about the guys who died what about the planes who never came back the holes in the returning aircraft then represented areas where the bomber could take damage and still come back basically this is actually a test of resilience this is a plane which can take this damage and still come back the ones that took the damage in other parts of the plane are not here and the reason why they are not here is because they have crashed notice the areas look at the picture the pilot cabin has no damage the engines have no damage of course if you think logically the ones with if the pilot has been shot dead the plane is going to crash right if the engines have you know failed you will see a plane crashing so what are we looking at the big lesson here is called survivorship bias it tells you a lot about how to look at evidence that how to think how to think like a statistician and there are unbelievably powerful applications of these ideas that i use all the time i saved more money from losses by using this idea than probably any other idea so you are you are training yourself to ask when you are presented with some piece of information you are somebody is giving you some piece of information in this case this is a photograph of a plane you have to ask yourself train yourself to ask what am i not seeing what am i missing here what is the piece of evidence that i need to see to get a correct conclusion the world will look very different to you when you ask this question all the time when somebody comes to you and presents data that looks impressive you must pause and ask what am i not seeing when you see a guy who smokes three packs of cigarettes a day and he lives to the age of 99 looks very impressive a lot of people will say oh wow this is a 99 year old guy he smokes three packs of cigarettes a day therefore smoking cannot be all that harmful no as a statistician you will think what about all those guys who did not smoke how many of those are there maybe out of 1000 people there is one guy in the group of smokers who lived to the age of 99 but there are 50 of them in the age of non smokers i am not seeing those 50 guys so to draw the conclusion that smoking is not all that harmful would be absolutely incorrect by looking at this just one data point because it is not representative of reality you see 
one of the biggest challenges that you will face is that you are seeing a piece of evidence and you've been asked to think about is this representative of reality or is this exception and to do that you have to train yourself over and over again to think like walt the statistician my last example is that of a theorem that you i think have studied it's called bayes theorem um it is a very important theorem of course when i studied it in school i did not revisit it for more than 25 years because i completely forgot about it then i came across it in a couple of books that i read about and i realized my god this is such a powerful theorem and i went and did some talks on that and i learned it up and i use it routinely now now you remember bayes theorem it's about conditional probability it basically tells you how to respond to new information that comes i won't spend more time on it uh, except that i will show you a different way of thinking about bayes theorem there are some prior odds there is a likelihood ratio and you end up with posterior odds basically there is a current belief you have there is new information that comes in which will make you change that belief it either strengthen your belief or weaken your belief and that results in a new belief the new belief is posterior odds the prior belief was prior odds and the likelihood ratio is the information that comes okay so now the way to think about this is to uh, I, let me give you an example here uh yeah a while back i made a video about bayes rule and explained how it A while back, I made a video about Bayes' rule and explained how it had been influential in my thinking. I didn't really, however, explain how Bayes' rule works um, or what it is, so I'm going to do that today. I'll start with a puzzle. Imagine that you're walking across the campus of some large American university and you meet a guy, let's call him Tom. You chat with Tom for a few minutes and you notice that Tom is shy. He's not really making eye contact very often, he's um, mumbling. And my question for you is, if you had to guess, would you guess that Tom is more likely to be in a math PhD program or in the business school? Let's assume it has to be one or the other. So I don't know what you guessed, but uh, I've taught a class on Bayes' rule a bunch of times, so I can tell you what most people guess, and that is that Tom is more likely to be a math PhD student. Um, the reasoning is that shyness is just much more common in math PhDs than in business schools. And I think this is accurate based on my experience. There's an old joke that goes, how can you tell the extroverted mathematician? And th the answer is, he's the one looking at your shoes instead of his shoes. Anyway, so I think that observation is accurate, but there's another piece of information that's relevant and that people tend to forget when answering this question, and that is, how many math PhDs are there relative to business school students? There's a lot fewer. Uh, the numbers will vary from school to school, but it's something on the order of 10 times as many business school students as math PhD students. So we have these two pieces of information uh, about there being many more business students than math students, and also about shyness being more common among math students than business students. And the question is, how do we combine these two pieces to get one overall estimate about Tom? This is where Bayes' rule comes in. So you can imagine that this divided rectangle represents the relative proportions of math to business students, very roughly speaking. Um, we'll put it at one to 10. And now looking just at math students, we can ask how common is shyness? Um, I would very roughly guess that it's about 75% of math PhD students um, come off as shy. And now looking just at business school students, Again, guessing roughly, I'd say about 15% of business school students come off as shy. So now we've represented both of those pieces of information in one diagram, and we want to know whether Tom is more likely to be in a math program or a business program. We don't know which one he's in, but we do know that he's shy, which means that he must be in one of those lavender rectangles, right? Because those represent the shy math and the shy business students. So to get a sense of the relative probabilities of him being in math versus business, we just have to compare the relative sizes of those lavender rectangles. Um, and it looks roughly like 
the lavender business rectangle is about twice as big as the lavender math rectangle. And you can see how the math shakes out. We just multiply two linear ratios, the ratio of um, math to business students, which we put at one to 10, times the ratio of shyness in math versus shyness in business, which we put at 75 to 15. And multiplying those two linear ratios gives us a ratio of areas, which comes out to about one to two. So roughly twice as likely for Tom to be in the business program, even though shyness is more common among math students. So this is the mechanics of Bayes' rule. This is how it works. If you got this explanation, then you understood Bayes' rule in a manner which is way better than what I studied in school, by the way. What it basically tells you is that, you know, if you if you really understand the uh, the the way Bayes' rule works, basically tells you how do you respond to new information. The new information here is that you saw a student who is shy. Now, what people do is they look at the information which is much more to do with the likelihood ratio, information specific to the situation being exam examined. In this case, you see a, a, a guy and he he's very shy. You automatically start thinking that, oh, he's shy, therefore he must be a math PhD student. You don't ask the more important question or, an, or, or a very relevant question as to how common is math PhD programs in a university as compared to MBA programs. But you need both pieces of information to come to the right conclusion. And we, when we do that calculation, as you saw, your initial impression that you see a shy kid and you imagine or you assume that he must be a math, math PhD student would be wrong. It's much more likely that he's a business school student than a math PhD student, simply because the number of students who enroll for MBA program in a university is far, far more. So the prior odds overshadows the likelihood ratio in this case. In some cases it may not, but the point I'm making is that you cannot look at one piece of information and arrive at conclusions because you'll come to the wrong conclusion. So that's one very big uh, lesson that comes out that uh, of, of, uh, of Bayes' rule. That, uh, uh, that if you think like a Bayesian, you will not what you will not do what is called a stereotyping, which is what is happening. You look at a kid, he looks a lot like, uh, 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 he, he looks very shy, therefore he must be a math PhD student. Now, of course, this is a very limited application. You can really apply it in a lot of ways. And I do that all the time. So to just give you a context of how I apply it in my own field, it could be something like, you're looking at this company that is doing an IPO and it looks like a hot IPO. It looks like a very nice company to me. But before, and it may well turn out to be the next Apple and the next Microsoft and the next Infosys and the next whatever. But before I draw that conclusion, I should look at what normally happens in IPOs. What are the normal outcome of people putting their money in IPOs and so on. And of course you can apply it. I mean, I don't want to go much deeper into this, but the point is that there are initial impressions that are formed based on information that is very seductive, very impressive, for that situation, and it takes away the weightage that you would ascribe to a much more important but very boring piece of information called base rates, which in this case was how many math PhD students are there as compared to MBA students. So that was one big lesson that comes out of understanding base rule and using it routinely as to how the world works. The second big lesson that comes is to help you change your mind, and one of the most incredibly important things that you will have to learn if you want to become a wiser and a more intelligent and a, um, uh, and a happier person is the willingness to change your mind. And if there is one theorem that teaches us how to do that in a very formal way, it's Bayes' theorem. So here is an example. So it's a, taken from a book by a guy called Nate Silva. Uh, and the example is about what happened in 9-11 uh, in 2001 when uh, when uh, when a plane crashed into uh, the World Trade Center. Now the first plane has crashed. Prior to the crash, you're basically trying to think about what is the probability of this being a terror attack. Notice how the problem has been set up. The initial estimate of how likely it is that terrorists will crash into plane into Manhattan skyscraper is very, very remote. It's very small, it's X. 
Now there are the other probabilities that are provided that I've been plugging into the equation that I've, you already know about Bayes' theorem. You start from a prior probability. Now you look at a posterior probability. One plane has crashed into the building, one of the trade center towers, and the probability jumps from 0.005% to 38%, right? This is how it goes. But the, here's the thing. Now the probability that you see here, posterior probability becomes the prior probability for the next iteration. Now what happens is the new piece of information comes, which is the second plane has crashed. So what happens when you plug these same numbers, this 38% number that you see here becomes the prior probability after you learn that the second plane has also crashed into uh, the, the tower next to it, then what are the chance that this is a terror attack? The probability jumps to 99.99%. Notice what is happening here. What are we really doing? We have a prior belief that the probability that planes will crash as a part of a terrorist attack into a Manhattan skyscraper is very small. Then the first one happens, the probability that it was a terror attack jumps. Then the second one happens, the probability jumps to 99%. So your beliefs are changing in light of new information, right? Which is the key attribute of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of good decision-making behavior. Belief updating is to good forecasting as brushing and flossing are to good dental hygiene. Now, why is this important to you? I think it's terribly important for you because one of the things that makes a mind a good mind is the willingness to change that mind. And people are not constructed like that. Bayesians are inherently constructed like that because they are there. It is their job to change their minds in light of new information that comes in. Uh, now, how do non-Bayesians be behave on the other hand? They don't like changing minds. They are very obstinate. They have prior beliefs. New information comes in. They, uh, they do not like changing minds. What a man believes, he prefers to be true. When facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? A lot of people change the facts or they ignore the new facts. They don't like to change their minds. This is one of the key principles of social psychology, which you will learn when you study social psychology, that people have this tendency to have fixated mindsets. They don't like to change their prior conclusions for all sorts of reasons. Many things combined, I'm not gonna go into that. But the fact is, if you look at really outstanding people, great thinkers, whether in business or in politics or in science, wherever you look, you'll find that they will be very easy, they happy to change their minds. Now, the one, the first benefit was of course that, you know, changing mind is a key ingredient. The second is that, you become insensitive to, you no longer insensitive to base rates. Before looking at an image uh, of a person, of just after looking at an image, you will automatically ask how many other people out there who actually don't smoke and they also live to the age of 99. Um, you tend, you, you become much more objective if you did this, uh, if you become a Bayesian, because you start looking at the world in a very different way. Uh, you start looking at your beliefs as not, Sure, you'll never be sure about anything. You'll have a view. Your view is based on current information that you have in your current understanding of that information, but you have an open mind, which means that you're willing to change your mind. And it's, this could happen even when you're having a conversation. You know, the most outstanding Bayesian thinkers are the ones who, when having the conversation, they're collecting information and they're willing to adapt. They're willing to change their mind in light of new facts. By the way, in my field, in the field of investing, if you don't have this trade, you will probably never have a good outcome in your investment uh, investment uh, returns. The reason is that you are operating in a statistical world. It's a very probabilistic world. Things that made sense yesterday may not make sense today. The beliefs that you had yesterday may become invalid today. Maybe they were based on wrong facts. Maybe your interpretation was wrong. Maybe your reasoning was wrong or maybe the world has changed. So this is, a, this is obviously a very important trait to acquire. I can't give more time to this, unfortunately, because we don't have much time left. I want to leave some for Q&A for you. But the idea here to understand is that these are not things that were taught to you without reason, but the people who taught you those things probably 
they themselves don't know how to use these things over a period of time. You have to use these things. These tools are there for you. You are the ones who have to pick them up and apply them routinely. I and mean, these are like your weapons in the sense that uh, there are these seven or eight weapons that I've given you today. Uh, not that you didn't have them already, but uh, the fact that I want you to recognize the role of academe, academia, that we, we provide you with these ideas is up to you to go out and use them to become a better decision maker and a better thinker and a more happier, intelligent person out there in life. Going back to what I said earlier, I've only given you eight examples from just one field. As you run through your education at Flame University, you are likely to find many, many more ideas, maybe 50, 60, 70 ideas from different fields, from psychology, from biology, from chemistry, from physics, from many other disciplines out there. You really have to understand that these are extremely, extremely powerful ideas. They are very versatile. Um, they, you, can, you have to learn how to apply them to become wiser uh, over, over, over time. And they will come from diff, uh, multiple disciplines, which is why being in Flame University is going to be very helpful to you uh, because they are, they are one of the few places which uh, encourages uh, that kind of teaching. And that you only need a handful. And when you have them available to you in your brain, then you can just draw on them and use them to understand how they allow, how, how the world really works and how they often combine to produce extraordinary outcomes. I end by talking about uh, one of um, the quotes of Charlie Munger. Worldly wisdom is very, very simple and I'm urging you, it's not that hard to do if you have the will, uh, you have the will to flow through and do it. And the rewards are awesome, absolutely awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It was indeed a very, very insightful session. I would request all the participants to post their questions addressed to sir in the Q&A uh, option available. Uh, I already see quite a few questions coming in. Uh, sir, uh, you have actually brought in prospect theory in a very easy and understandable way. Uh, how human behavior changes and the magnitude of loss your decision making gets hampered. And yeah. even power of compounding, reduction, inversion, what we usually learn in algebra in our seventh, eighth, ninth, and so on, uh, dependent on the various uh, school structures that we uh, one undergoes. Uh, for the benefit of all the attendees, I would like to give a brief about uh, Mr. Sanjay Bakshi. He has been uh, an adjunct professor at Management Development Institute Gurgaon also called as MDI Gurgaon, and he teaches MBA students mostly second years. And uh, uh, the course that he usually covers is behavioral finance and business valuation. Uh, if you don't mind me also saying, uh, there have been a lot of uh, Vimeo videos that Sir has been uploading over the past few months. And uh, I think one of the uh, one which was quite interesting was Bhav uh, Bhagwan uh, Che. It actually was very, very interesting. So a lot of you would want to go into uh, the Vimeo videos and so on. And a, not a notable thing is also he's a managing partner at ValueQuest Capital LLP, a value investing firm based out of New Delhi. Uh, so we'll just wait a minute for all the questions to uh, get accumulated and then we can begin or probably we can begin. So. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for the introduction. And um, yeah, so uh, uh, actually I'm happy that I'm giving this talk to Flame University students instead of any other university simply because I know you guys are already teaching them these things and, um, and, they, and you will be in going forward as well. So it's so important that they, they learn this at this age. And you know, I wish I could uh, be reborn and come back and become a student at Flame University one day. Uh, <clears throat> I'll then learn the things uh, which I learned at the age of 45, I would learn at the age of 17. So that's really cool, right? Okay, so Kunal has asked me a question. How can we move ahead if you don't take some or other kind of risk? Nothing is certain, so how to go ahead without taking risk? That's a very good question. Risk-taking is a very essential ingredient for success. The 
question that I was talking about, uh, the problem that I was presenting was uh, actually, do I have to click on answer lines? What what happens? Do I have to? I don't so, know. Uh, you can answer it uh, verbally as well, and okay. then I'll just dismiss the question later on. Uh, uh, okay. So you know what we were trying to do, uh, Kunal, in the example was that you have to think about what can you afford to lose. You know, is it life? Is it wealth? Is it reputation? Is it character? Is it relationships? What is it? The point that I wanted to make was that if there is something that you absolutely cannot afford to lose, then on those things and those things alone, you should not take a risk, right? But at the same time, I also said that entrepreneurs or people, you know, if, you, if, if I gave you that gun example, if uh, at a very young age, when you have nothing to lose, when you have absolutely nothing to lose, let's say, talk about money, then you will take a chance. You will do something which is incredibly risky. If it works out, you made it. So there is a time to be risk averse and there's a time to be risk seeking. When you are young and daring and have nothing to lose, it's time to be risk seeking. If those risks pay off, and now you have acquired something, it could be money, it could be reputation, it could be, you know, a whole lot of things. Now you've got something that you just absolutely can't afford to lose. Therefore, your own risk management or risk taking abilities would change over time. And this is the point that I couldn't bring out. But uh, because of your question, I'm bringing it out right now. So yeah, so I agree with you that you have to take risks. There are certain risks that you have to take at certain points in life. But uh, don't go around uh, doing things that can take you all the way to zero because that's just not worth it. If the probability of winning is higher, then isn't the risk of ruin? I think this is the same question in a sense. A small chance of ruin when you don't have much. You see, the problem about one way to answer this is startup ventures. You know, young people do startup ventures. Uh, and most of them will fail. If you look at the baseline information, most startups will fail. If you look at the, stat the normal statistical outcome of a startup venture is failure. But here is the thing. What happens to a given entrepreneur whose conviction is that I will be an entrepreneur for life in the first failure and the second failure and the third failure? Learning, right? You learn. And then all you have to do is get lucky once. So definitely, uh, what you again the risk of ruin here is about somebody who has already reached a point in life where he cannot afford to risk ruin at all but for a young person who's starting out taking risk going back to zero starting again learning in an ecosystem where there are people who can fund you people who will fund you just because they like your uh, like your entrepreneurial uh, character they like the fact that you actually failed in fact in you know, many parts of the world where startup is very common, uh, having a couple of failed ventures in the past, it actually looks good on your CV. So I get that. And I think uh, that's what you're probably alluding, alluding, alluding to, that um, you don't always go by the probabilities. You have to think about the consequences. And sometimes when the consequences are severe, you walk away from the risk instead of getting into a, a game where the expected value may be large, but the risk is just not worth taking. Uh, okay, so I get to know uh, Raman. Uh, I generally like the speech. Thank you so much for introducing the beauty of compound interest to have a doubt con concerning the compound interest and Marcia Lotus. You said, My question is, what is the guarantee that the bank in which you invest the principal amount, as stated in your speech, will not go bankrupt before we receive ours? What is the guarantee of people who invest today's money or energy to have until mature with higher interest? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I was talking essentially about uh, not putting your money in a bank account or anything like that. I was talking about uh, delaying your gratification and using the money to make an investment via a portfolio of a collection of businesses, which is what I do, which is what a lot of people will come and teach you about in Flame University because of the origin of Flame University itself is uh, based on um, uh, 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 on the thought process of many of, of, it, of the founders who have done very well in life because of being successful investors, right? So here, we're not talking about putting your money in a bank, no, and, and of course not in a risky bank. We're talking about 
putting your money in businesses so one of the things in compound interest which i did not talk about was that come there are compound interest in bank accounts which is very really easy to understand there is also compound interest in businesses and so there is there is a compound interest which you can easily understand you are compounding your money in a fixed deposit you are compounding your money in a mutual fund investment you are compounding your money in a bank deposit those are very easy to understand concepts and everybody gets that a lot of people don't understand that the compound interest is also inherent inside a business model and you learn that when you learn that um things like return on invested capital is a ratio which is synonymous in a sense to the compound interest formula right how much money you are putting up and what will you earn over that so if a business can compound capital internally at a good rate of return and is run by good quality people and can do it for a long long time because it has a let's say a, a competitive advantage then it is going to create wealth right and there are like huge number of examples of that in uh, of in india and globally so my idea here is to not put money in a bank but to put money in real businesses that are also compounding capital and multiple of them even though some of them might fail the ones that make up the make money will make so much money that uh, they will more than offset the losses that i will have in the failure so this is one of the most important ideas about equity investing is that there are asymmetric payoffs what that means is that the maximum that you can lose is all the money you put up in a given investment right suppose you bought something for 100 bucks per share 100 bucks uh, you paid a price of 100 rupees per share what is the maximum that you can lose 100 rupees what is the maximum that you can make unlimited right you can make 1000 bucks 20000 bucks 50000 bucks you can make a million bucks you know the stories of people who bought apple or you know even tesla or something like that the upside is unlimited the downside is capped now what that means is that if you go wrong in some of the ideas sure you will lose money there but there are other ideas in the portfolio that can more than uh, offset the losses in the ones that don't work out very well so uh, so there are asymmetric payoffs of investing in businesses investing in 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 companies and my idea is to create a portfolio of uh, of of such companies and uh, and, uh, and and enjoy the the benefits of compounding that is happening inside these businesses even though some of them may blow up because of bad luck or bad decisions or my ba ba bad judgment and so on and so forth all right uh, ishita is asking the concept of proof by contradiction mentions that if something is in true then it has to be false but we studied critical reasoning that this kind of logic is actually a fallacy called fallacy of false alternatives which talks about the dangers of black and white thinking so how and when should we use this concept according to when it is applicable and when it is not now i'm not fully understood the question i have understood the part when you're talking about the dangers of black and white thinking ishita that i completely agree with because what that means is that there are shades of gray which is exactly what bayesian thinking tells you that there are no certainties that there is no such thing as 100% probability or 0% thing you have a initial view your view will change over time in light of new information so that's what bayesian reasoning talks about the proof by contradiction on the other hand is a is a different idea it basically forces you to become a critical thinker by challenging propositions presented to you by others and even your own existing propositions by sometimes uh, you know um, coming to conclusions that if they are right then they must make your original theory wrong and therefore you are forced to change your mind at the end of the day whether you are using proof by contradiction or you are using um, bayesian reasoning essentially what you are doing is you are training yourself to have a flexible mind that i can be wrong and i'm not going to be having a fixated mindset of not being willing to change my mind in light of new information or new analysis that comes in and these are just tools that help us do that whether it is proof by contradiction or um, uh, bayesian there are different areas that where you will use them it's just that you need to use them routinely and uh, i'll give an example so my driver the other day who i caught cheating came back he took my small car uh, uh, a honda jazz and he came back and he presented me with a i'd send him for petrol you know 
go and get petrol he comes back and gives me a petrol on the on the bill it says uh, something like 60 liters 55 liters and the tank of the petrol of that car is something like 40 liters so 40 liter petrol engine tank size comes back with a petrol bill which says it took 60 liters because he mixed up the cars you know he he he's, he's screwed up on that front uh, the point is is i mean when i confronted him he said no sir it's a 60 liter hi dala hai to 60 liter kaise dala hai yaar to to ke uske andar to capacity 35 liters ka hai 40 liters ka hai so the proof of contradiction hai the point is that you always looking for things that contradict something that somebody wants you to believe or something that even you want to believe and that by itself is a very very powerful idea and a very uh, i would say desirable trait to have if you want to become a good decision maker in life uh okay we have a question uh could you please brief about small probabilities on didn't quite understand so i would ask you to pick up a wonderful book called uh uh two books actually fooled by randomness by nasim taleb and uh, the second one is the black swan by nasim taleb again the the these two um, books were written by uh, this fa- fabulous uh, author called a guy called nasim taleb you probably heard about him but these books will tell you everything that you need to know on these subjects the black swan particularly deals with um uh, small probabilities uh but large outcomes and by the way no, uh, not all uh, while i talked only about small probabilities large outcomes and the outcomes were negative that's not always the case sometimes it's the opposite in venture capital for example when you invest most of your most of your investments will result in losses but the ones that pay off will pay off so big so big that they will compensate for the ones that blow up so you may have a situation where there's a chance of success is very small but if you succeed you're going to be so successful that it will turn everything else irrelevant all the other losses will become absolutely irrelevant so we have to understand that the uh, you may have a negative black swan where uh, you have a small probability but very bad consequences things like you know putting a gun on your head and pulling the trigger even if there are like 30 chambers in the in the gun and you're only pulling it once it's small probability but very bad consequences on the other hand you may have a situation where you have small probability but very good consequences so what nothing tolly talks about is now there are these crazy asymmetric payoffs both ways there are negative black swans and there are positive black swans if you want to be good having a good life you should do whatever it takes to avoid negative black swans and you should try to gain exposure to positive black swans and there are ways of doing that and that to do with luck and how to get exposure to luck and how to get lucky i'm not going to talk about that today but the books that i mentioned to you talk a lot about those ideas so if you want to learn more about small probabilities large consequences which is basically to do with both sides of the equation black swans and um, positive black swans and negative black swans i would urge you to pick up those two books and read them okay ishita is asking how should i take the risk of losing something now when i'm not even sure that there will be an opportunity for gain in the future um i think if i change the question to why should i take the risk of losing something now when i'm not even sure that there will be an opportunity to gain in the future i think that's the correct question i'll answer that question instead of how i'll change it to why why should i take the risk of losing something now when i'm not even sure that there will be an opportunity to gain in the future okay my answer to that is you are young right now you are young and therefore if you lose now firstly i would imagine that you have very little to lose uh and losses are not something you see one thing which i've learned in life is something that i read somewhere else later on was um losses are not the opposite of success Fa- sorry failure is not the opposite of success failure is an ingredient of success think about this for a moment right if you start thinking failure as an ingredient of success what that means is that 
you will reframe failure into a lesson whatever you lost you will count that as a tuition fees and because you are young and because you are an optimistic and because you have faith in yourself you will approach life as a learner as a true learning machine that yes i did something it didn't work out too bad tough luck i am going to try again and this is what i learned i will not make the same mistake again because i am a learning machine and i see other people make similar mistakes i am not going to do that also because i want to learn from uh, the mistakes of other people as well but i am a learning machine so making mistakes now in the expectation that you will make no mistakes or very few mistakes going forward is actually a very good idea so i don't see any reason why you should not take risk of losing something now because even though you are not sure that there will be an opportunity there will be opportunity that's what entrepreneurship is about the reason why people become very risk averse is because they don't realize that let let me give you an example so you know a lot of old people and pension pensioners a lot of people think that you know putting your money in a fixed deposit is safe now i'm not even talking about weak banks which blow up i'm talking about state bank of india fixed deposit which today will give you 3 or 4% you see if you put all your money in fixed deposit in a bank you are 100% sure of losing money why because when i talk about losses i don't talk about losses in terms of nominal capital i talk about losses in real capital you see when inflation is 6% and you say oh i don't like taking risk i'm not going to put money in equities i'm not going to put money in ventures i'm not going to put money in things which are risky things then paradoxically you're actually taking more risk because if you put all your money in a 3% fixed deposit in a world where the inflation is 6% you're losing 3% real every year which means that after 10 or 20 years if you keep doing this you will have less money to buy things than you would have if you not done this thing on the other hand if you take some chance and because of skill or because of luck you get lucky you will lose in some but you will make in the other but the money that you will make is the one which work will make so much money for you that you will come out ahead so at least in the the second situation that i just described you at least have a shot of making money in the first situation when you are putting all your money but you think you're playing safe but you're really not playing safe you're putting money in a fixed deposit in a world which inflation rates are more than the rate of uh, uh, interest you are 100% sure of losing money so in my world or what, what i have learned from warren buffett that inflation is a key element of thinking about risk so to think that you are being risk averse is sometimes wrong you are you think you are being risk averse but actually you are risk seeking many situations um shruti what is you are asking sir what is your opinion on the contrast of first idea that you presented that several people regret not enjoying their youth ha huh, that's a good one okay so um depends on what you mean by enjoying your youth if enjoyment of your youth means uh fomo that fear of missing out everybody is having a party i need to be in a party sure you can do that um, but there's a cost associated with that you will realize the cost 10 20 30 years on the road on the other hand if you have a vision on something that you want to be 10 20 30 years from now and you have a laser sharp focus on that you would know the cost and you're willing to pay that cost the cost in that case will be um delayed gratification sacrifices uh not having a lot of fun uh again it's your choice uh the thing is that um uh, i don't think people who be become very successful in life because of early sacrifices that they make they will regret not enjoying their youth i don't think so that's the case here uh the opposite is actually much more common that people who have a chill life and easy life in the beginning and they uh they did not uh spend time in getting better at anything they end up uh, becoming not very successful and they uh, they have a much tougher life going forward it's really a choice between now and later so you have to make that choice on your own everybody has to make their own choices but uh, i i really feel that uh, if you are if you want to do anything in life you have to have one intensity of focus number 1 of what you want to do and which means minimum distractions 
and uh, and then the the, ability, the willingness to make sacrifices and you know i have to do that i'll give an example of my own life you know i like to teach i am a very passionate teacher and i try to become better in my teaching and when teaching comes in my life my family knows that i will i will refuse to go on holidays i will refuse school reunions i will refuse a lot of fun things with my family and my friends because i am in the teaching mode because i really want to become it's just one of my callings in life has been become a good teacher right inspire people so i want to get better at that game and i know that every year i look at my uh, decks i find that the you know last year's decks were not as good as they could have been so i try to improve over the years so there is no end point to this journey there is no such thing as perfection here but it's just the inherent desire to get better at something and if you want to really truly do that on anything you will not think of those as big sacrifices i don't think that that will be a because once you achieve the objective of becoming whatever you want to become you look back and say and think that yeah that was all worth it at least i hope so rahil i don't have a favorite mental model it's important to have no favorites here you see what is important is to have a broad mind the very fact that you are making it favorite means that you will overuse it even when it is inappropriate so the important question to ask is how many do i have and how many do i routinely use and the answer to that is about 30 or 40 but to say that i have a favorite mental model i really don't um achita is asking sir when we are talking about the formula of compound interest correlating to the example you gave us about mastering one key a thousand times and investing time to increase one skill you are good at but in times and academic excellence measure at nearly equal scale uh the amount of extra curricular activity in corporate and historical scottish in my answer to that is no i agree with you that uh, modern education systems have failed in fact i have a um uh, a view on this you see everybody has certain skills and what that means is that if you are really good at something you are pretty bad at something else it could be anything and you know the problem with modern education system is that we want to create a holistic person we want to so if you are doing bad in one one subject you are told to improve that but to improve in that one subject you have to let go of the time and the uh, desire to spend time on another subject that you are really good at because you can get better and better at it the problem is that what modern education systems typically try to do is to create all rounded personalities but if you really look at the world if you look at tiger woods now he was a phenomenal phenomenal golfer but he miserably failed in one aspect of his life if you study his biography if you take anybody you know if you take any of the movie stars you know they are really good at what they do but that doesn't mean that they are good in politics and they are good in you know uh, relationships at home and they are good fathers and mothers and all that no no that's not the case the point is extreme success if you want it and not all want it which is fine almost always comes at a cost of some elements of your personality that are left wanting elsewhere so it's totally your call is something if you have found your calling like i have a friend of my daughter who is crazy about um uh squash so she is one of india's squash champions to her squash is everything she would do every anything in his in her life to play squash she is dreaming squash she is thinking squash she is getting up in the morning playing squash she is going all over the world entering into squash and as a consequence obviously as a consequence her grades will suffer in some parts of her, the, you know in some, in many part but boy she is i think going to become one of the most successful squash players india has ever produced maybe the world has ever produced so you can't get that so there you will always have to make those sacrifices uh so it's totally your call um sir i understand konal is asking did it get my concern is in the world of internet it's all about now or never okay oh yeah it's a good question so one thing one of the problems about technology is that they make it hard for you to delay gratification and one reason that is because you see if you look at facebooks and the whatsapp and the twitters and the instagram of the world their business model thrives on 
exploiting your attention span they want your attention right they don't want you to look at anywhere else they want you to be in their platforms right and they pro- make it easy for you to do that because there is network economics and there are all your friends are on insta and you want to see what they are doing what you're eating what you're doing but the fact that they are making money out of that right but what is it doing to you see what is it doing to you it is making it hard for you to focus because the very kick that you get by sharing a picture of your food with your friends or giving a like or you know a comment or something or you know whatever you do you know interactions or being in the whatsapp discussion or whatever it is that you guys do it gives you something right you feel very good about it i am i'm part of this happening thing i you know i don't want to be out of it i will have fomo if i am out of it i don't want to miss all these things this is all contrived this is all a plan this is all a conspiracy against you because there is money in it for these guys and the money is clearly from advertising right once they hook you you are hooked so you have to decide if you want to do something you have to delay all these things you have to sorry you have to uh concentrate you have to focus and you can't focus in a world of technology because the system is coming after you in i i can i can assure you that most of you don't have the patience to read a 20 page document forget about reading a book it's not easy because you know you have these notifications popping up or something or other is happening in your life which you think is terribly important this, this is the whole point there are all these companies who want you to believe that this is more important i am more important than anything else but you have to decide for yourself what is truly important to you is something that is truly important to you for which you want to be known to the world then you'll have to shut off all these things at least for many many hours you need to have intensity of focus in whatever you want to accomplish and you can't get intensity of focus unless you can shut out the distractions and the distraction that the world of internet produces is incredible and they've been making it harder and harder for people to get out of so i use all sorts of tricks you know i don't have notifications on my phone i don't have mails that come in on their own and pop up i don't have i have a software called focus and i click on that then all internet is shut off you know i do all sorts of things so basically you have technology to fight technology to be sure there are companies who benefit from you know uh, uh, grabbing your attention and not letting it go to something else that is much more meaningful likely to be for you but there is also technology that can fight that technology so delaying gratification remains an important idea but it's getting harder to do that because of all these momentary pleasures that you derive by just being part of a global network we think that happening and you just want to be part of that but truly outstanding authors inventors uh scientists if you look at all of them they you don't find them on these platforms or if they're on this platform they're only there to learn and then move away they're only there for just a couple of hours they're not constantly looking at their phones and doing things just to see what the hell is happening in the world they only focus on what's happening in their world they want to do well in what they are doing for that they have to find the time and there is no time for them to do all these things you find some of the best people in the world the most admired people in the world they are not even on social media because they know what this thing does, does to you so you have to make your own decision on that uh utsav is asking it was a great session could you please share a reading resource for this for concept as application real life decision making well i think uh clay will going to give it to you if you go to their library i don't know if you been to the library there's a library i am told there's a library called library of mistakes go to that place and you will learn more about life than anything else so one thing that you have to do is to read read across read biology read chemistry read history do these online courses you know there are these wonderful online master class courses do the course on 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 history by yuval harari there are all sorts of things that you can do but the thing is that if you have to do those things then you can't do a lot of other things which i just told you about that you have to get off the social media you have to get off this treadmill of social media to be able to really learn on things chetan is asking there are markets participants like richard dennis paul to the jones at uh, sicota who have created immense wealth by using concept of risk of ruin as chance of success was high again i don't understood the question here very honestly i think what you are saying is that they will take the risk of ruin 
because it's offset by the chance of success. Is I don't know if you're saying that. I don't think you're saying that, but I wonder if you were. Um, um, I, you see, you have to understand losing all of your money in one commitment is not the same thing as losing all of your money altogether. Warren Buffett, this, so, so, the, so what, what you may be alluding to is the concept of risk aversion versus loss aversion. You should not be loss averse. Taking losses on things that have not worked out is fine. What you don't want to end up is to end up with such a huge loss that takes you down to a level where it is very hard to come back up. These are very different concepts. You know, there is a concept of ergodicity, which I haven't brought in today, which is very useful. And you can find it on my blog. I have done a whole lecture on this, so you can read that. But it's important for you to understand that there's a huge difference between risk aversion and loss aversion. What I would rather have you be risk averse, but not loss averse, which means that you're willing to lose money, even large amounts of money, in some of your positions, in some of the ideas, in some of the things that you're doing, some of the projects that you're working on, but the consequences of all those losses will not be so severe that it will take you to zero or anywhere close to zero. Uh, so could we uh, take the last question now? Okay, Akash Lodar, okay. Are decisions made on instinct gut work in a great manner as to believe deeply on what decision you take? This is a good question. One thing which you will learn over the years is as you become better at any given discipline, a lot of the things that people call as intuitions is actually wired into your brain is expertise that is there. For example, a, a brain surgeon who has done uh, you know, 500 surgeries is looking at a scan and he's able to quickly tell that this is the problem with the patient. Whereas an MBA, MBBS intern who is doing, uh, you know, uh, 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 who's learning to be a brain surgeon as an intern with this particular brain surgeon is actually baffled as how could you do this in like 10 seconds, right? But the thing is that the, the junior doctor thinks that the senior doctor is using intuition and yeah, there is an overlap here, but really expertise uh, appears to be intuition. When people become really good at what they do, they can come to very quick judgment because they're using these models. They're using these patterns. A lot of the learning is pattern recognition. They're using these patterns that they have assimilated over the years to repeat practice, things that work, things that don't work, things that are likely to, this, this is what is likely to be going wrong with this patient. They can come to judgment which are very accurate and very quick. And people think this is all intuition, but my hypothesis here is that it's not all intuition. A lot of it is to do with a lot of hard work that has gone over decades, which causes the people to become experts in the first place. Uh, thank you, sir. It was indeed a very insightful session and a lovely Q&A. Uh, if any further students have questions, uh, I'll share the email ID with you on yes. the Moodle page so that you can write him a mail <laughs> and he would be happy to address it. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, all the attendees and participants can now leave the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. So yeah, I got to run now. I just realized it's, <laughs> it's uh, Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you.